Ten years ago, I sat down with former President Jimmy Carter after he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and was celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Carter Center. It was 2002. This year marks the 30th anniversary of that inspiring institution, celebrating three decades of waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope at the Carter Center. We're pleased to welcome the 39th President of the United States, President Jimmy Carter. President Carter, welcome to the program. I'm delighted to talk to you, Mark. You know, we spoke about 10 years ago to the day uh, when the Carter Center was celebrating its 20th anniversary. So much has passed in this last decade. It's been quite tumultuous. We've seen world changes, global conflict, financial collapse, Arab Springs, civil wars all over the place, extreme weather, disease, famine. It's been quite a 10 years, sir. Well, we are deeply involved in the Arab Spring. We, I'll be leaving tomorrow for Egypt. Uh, which will be our 90th troubled election that the Carter Center has uh, monitored. We're trying to bring democracy to Egypt. I was there earlier when they elected a parliament, and uh, we'll be electing a president uh, this month. And then we also continue to follow other countries. We already helped with uh, with the election in Tunisia, and we're working in Algeria and also Libya. So we're deeply involved in bringing democracy and peace to people. Uh, 85% of our budget, though, still goes to health care where we eliminate diseases in countries. We're getting rid of rural blindness, for instance, and in Latin America. We've succeeded with that already. Uh, we'll soon be eliminating guinea worm, a dracoon colitis, from all the nations of the world. We started out with 3.5 million cases, and we're down now to about 125 cases just located in South Sudan. We also work sometimes with uh, troubled countries. I was in North Korea last year. I might be going back this year. I've been there three times, by the way, to try to bring peace to the Korean Peninsula and to do away with the nuclear threat in North Korea. So we, we go where we can bring peace and, and, I would say, human rights and democracy and alleviate suffering primarily from illnesses. Organizationally, the Carter Center breaks itself up into two categories, really, peace and, and health. That's exactly right. Yeah, explain that concept to us, please. Well, peace involves several things. One is the, the actual negotiation of peace agreements <clears throat> that I've done between Ethiopia and Eritrea, between, between uh, Sudan and Uganda and in other cases around the world. We also include under peace the programs that we have just described in holding elections or monitoring elections. To repeat myself, we are now involved in our 90th troubled election in Egypt. So that's to end wars or prevent the outbreak of a pending war and then the holding of elections. After I leave Egypt, by the way, after we elect a president mm -hmm. there in the next few days, I'll be going on to Sudan to be working with the two leaders in Sudan and southern Sudan to try to keep them from going to war with each other. <clears throat> the United States won't deal with, with the leader in, uh, in Sudan because he's indicted by the criminal court. But we have health programs there, so I deal with him regularly, hmm. for instance. And, of course, that's and also under the aegis of peace, we include our human rights program. And we've been involved in creating the International Criminal Court. We've been involved in bringing to the United Nations the High Commission on Human Rights, as well as dealing with individual cases of human rights abuses. So that's our peace program. Our health program involves the prevention of illnesses primarily, but the curing of illnesses that are no longer known in the developed world. Uh, we deal primarily with diseases that the World Health Organization calls neglected tropical diseases. Mm -hmm. They have strange names, like trachoma, onchocerciasis, trachuncolysis, schistosomiasis, lymphatic filariasis. Those are uh, illnesses that afflict hundreds of millions of people in Latin America and in Africa, but are no longer known at all in the more developed part of the world. So that's the kind of thing that we do, and about 85% of our budget goes into very expensive going into individual villages and teaching the people uh, how to prevent their suffering or to give them medicines. They quite often are donated to us by big corporations. They say that changing the world is a young man's game. Uh, I think they've got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to depend on a lot of young people. For instance, in southern Sudan, where we have the last few cases of guinea worm, we now have 8,200 trained volunteers that are not on our payroll. They just work because they want to do good things for their own neighbors. Uh, plus, we have about 110 on our payroll, almost all of whom live in southern Sudan, that we have trained. So from an old person like me at the head of the Carter Center, we have to reach out into the youthful generations after me 
to get you get the work done. There's a lot of pessimism when it comes to Africa that you find uh, attitudinally that Africa's problems are not solvable. It's a lost cause. I, I assume you disagree. Well, I certainly do. Just take Guinea worm, for instance. When we started dealing with it, we had Guinea worm in 20 different countries, 23,600 villages. And now we only have guinea worm in one country, and we have a total number of cases of just 125 cases so far this year. So that shows that what the people themselves can do if they're given an opportunity to correct their own problems and given a little bit of training and the adequate medicines. And we also, of course, deal with other diseases as well. We have trained, for instance, about 30,000 health workers in Ethiopia. And we've cut down the incidence of malaria in Ethiopia, the most heavily endemic case on earth, about 86%, just because we've treated bed nets in every home in Ethiopia that has malaria mosquitoes. So we work side by side with the government forces in those countries, and we try to give them credit when any successes that are reached. Let me shift topics for a second, sir. Studies show that global consciousness is on the rise uh, for sustainability and corporate responsibility, and people seem to be demanding more from their governments, their universities, their employers, even the companies they invest in. Do you see this when you outreach in, in Europe and the United States? Well, I think in our country, we are at the bottom of the generous countries on Earth. I just got back from Norway, for instance, where they give a full 1% of their total federal budget to benevolent causes. And the same thing happens in Denmark and Sweden and Finland and Austria and a few other countries. In our country, we give about one-tenth that much. But I think that we'll make up for it in our country by the generosity of major foundations like the Gates Foundation, for instance, and, and corporations. For instance, we've just finished giving a 150 millionth dose of free medicine that comes from Merkin Company to prevent robo blindness. And I just met a few minutes ago with the leader of Glaxo Smith Klein, who gives us the free medicine to deal with lymphatic fullerosis or elephantiasis. So the major corporations are also very generous along with uh, foundations. But I would say that the corporate world is now becoming much more involved in trying to alleviate suffering in very poor countries on earth by giving their products to people like the Carter Center. And we actually go into the village and deliver them or put the medicine in people's mouths. What message would you share with CEOs of large corporations about how they can become change agents in, in today's world? Well, I think one of the things is that, that people respect the free enterprise system all over the world, even if they may not have adequate opportunity in a, their own country to benefit from it. But, but the great American corporations and those in Europe uh, have a, a good responsibility and I would say a better opportunity to do this. For instance, I've been to the headquarters of Merkin Company in our country, and I've met with about 6,000 of our people in a big tent outside, and we showed them just a brief movie of what their product was doing to prevent river blindness. And I and the chief executive officer of Merck and, and a few other people, a lot of people in the audience were actually weeping with uh, excitement and joy that every worker at Merck is contributing to the beneficial effect of their product in foreign countries and among people that they'll never meet. So I think that every company has a good opportunity not only to become an international affairs in a beneficent way, a helpful way, but also to boost the self-respect and the pride of their own employees in the generosity of the corporation. So that's a, that's a wonderful opportunity that I hope more corporations will explore. And I want to thank the ones that are already doing it in such a wonderful way in our country. All right. Before I let you go, I heard a rumor that you still swing a hammer and bang nails for Habitat for Humanity. Yes, we still do that. Uh, last uh, year we were in Haiti. We built 100 homes in the epicenter of the earthquake. And my, my wife and I, along with uh, volunteers, will be going back to Haiti this November to do the same thing. We'll finish up 500 homes for poor people in need in the earthquake center uh, in Haiti. And that's something we do. And this will be our 29th year that my wife and I have given one week of work along with a lot of other good volunteers to build habitat houses. All right, be honest now. Who, who hits a better nail, Rosalind or you, sir? <laughs> well, I probably hit more nails harder than Rosalind, but she does it the finer things like putting trims around doors and, and making sure that windows go up and down easily and things of that kind. So she, <laughs> she's pretty skilled caller. She can do anything in a house, by the way, all the way from putting the frame up to finishing the final touches. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you. And thank you, you too, again. sir. I'll talk to you in another 10 years. I look forward to that. Okay, okay sir. That was former President Jimmy Carter on the 30th anniversary of the Carter Center.